Good morning. Today is Sunday, January 14th, 2024. Animals play a surprisingly substantial role in this week's Torah portion, the Parsha of Bo, in which the Jewish people finally leave Egypt. The Torah says, as the Jewish people are leaving, there was not a single dog in all of Egypt that barked at the Jewish people, not only not at the Jewish people, the, there was no barking to the people or the animals that were leaving. Normally, people walk by, a dog barks, Certainly, if a lot of people walk by, maybe a dog would bark. But no dogs barked. In order to provide a wonder, something remarkable that distinguished between this group of Jewish people who were leaving Egypt and every other group of people, normally we would assume a dog would bark. But the dogs didn't bark. A little bit later in the Torah, we learn about a mitzvah. The Torah says, completely unrelated to this, the Torah says that we are required to have, to eat kosher food. Jews are required to eat kosher food. And what that means is that, first of all, for meat, it has to be a kosher species. And also, it has to be prepared in the proper manner. It requires shechita, ritual, uh, um, to be to be slaughtered in a ritual manner that reduces all the pain. It's got to be it's got to be slaughtered in a very specific manner. And if that does not happen, even if the animal is a kosher species, but let's say it died by force or it died on its own, that's called trefa. A trefa is an animal that is a kosher species of animal, but we're not allowed to eat it because it was not slaughtered in the proper manner. So what do you do with it? If there should be an animal that becomes a trefa, you're not allowed to eat it. You should give it to a dog. Dogs are entitled to that meat because it's perfectly good meat. Dogs eat this kind of meat. It's just that it's not permissible for a Jewish person to eat, so you can give it to a dog. Our rabbis ask, you mean to say only a dog? You can't give it to uh, some other animal? You can't give it to... to, uh, Why specifically a dog? So rabbis say, no, you can give it to any animal. Meaning, the whole point is, you're not allowed to eat it, but you can benefit it benefit from it by giving it to something or someone else who doesn't mind eating it. But why does it say a dog? Why use that example of a dog? So Rashi quotes the the comment of our sages. This comes to show that God does not withhold reward even from any animal. Because Back when the Jewish people left Egypt, the dogs did not bark. And that showed like honor that they recognized that this was something special was happening. The dogs recognized this. And the Torah therefore wants to reward them to say that the dogs are the one that should get this extra food, this delicious extra food. Even though, of course, it applies to any animal, but the Torah specifies dogs in order to show, so to speak, a reward for the behavior of the dogs in Egypt. Okay, it's a little bit of a strange lesson, but that's what our rabbis tell us. Then, later in our Parsha, we learn about some other animals. At the end of the Torah portion of Bo, the Torah talks about recognition of the firstborn, because the firstborn of the Egyptians were killed. That's the 10th plague. The firstborn of the Jews were saved. They were not subject to that terrible decree. And so part of remembering the exodus from Egypt is recognition of the firstborn. 
So all firstborn should be treated in a very special manner, should have a certain gratitude that they were not harmed in Egypt, and there are special rules that refer to the firstborn. For example, the Torah says, Kal peterechem Hashem. Every firstborn kosher animal is holy to Hashem. It's offered as an offering, a carbon, b'char. Also, not only kosher animals, but also peter chamar, tifte basse, also a chamar, a donkey, the firstborn donkey. Now, a donkey is not a kosher animal, but a firstborn donkey has a level of holiness. And then the Torah gives the third category, v'chol b'char ban adam b'banecha tifteh. And the firstborn of every, the firstborn son of every family is holy and requires redemption. That's the mitzvah pidyon haben. Okay, so the firstborn son, the firstborn kosher animal, but how is it the firstborn donkey? Because as a general rule, to use the term kedusha, holiness, that only applies to kosher animals. Only kosher animals can become holy and offered as an offering. The term holiness never is used in application to a non-kosher animal. The only exception is the chamar, the donkey which can achieve in its firstborn status a level of Kedusha, a level of holiness. What did the donkeys do to deserve this holiness, this very special categorization? Rashi says, Shesiu es Yisrael b'yetzias Mitzrayim. That the donkeys assisted the Jewish people as they left Egypt. The Jewish people left Egypt with lots of stuff. They left with gold and silver. Remember that they had borrowed and taken from the neighbors. They had animals. They had possessions, whatever they had. I mean, they didn't have a lot, but they had more than they could carry. And so there were donkeys. And the donkeys were piled high with all the belongings of the Jewish people. And so the donkeys carried everything. The donkeys were the schleppers. And therefore, because of this, the donkeys achieved a level of kedusha, a level of holiness not achieved by any other non-kosher animal because they helped the Jewish people, assisted the Jewish people leave Egypt. So if Yosef Chaim Zunnenfeld asked the following question, why doesn't the same thing happen to dogs? If God wants to reward the dogs, why doesn't the Torah say that the dogs should be holy? that the firstborn of the dog should be uh, should have to be redeemed like the donkeys. The dogs are rewarded for their part in the exodus from Egypt. Why should they have any less reward for their part in the exodus than the donkeys? So Rav Yosef Chaim Zunnenfeld says something very important. He says, at the time that the Jewish people left Egypt, the dogs kept quiet. They did not bark. It's a good thing they didn't bark. But the donkeys, at the time of the exodus from Egypt, they carried, they worked, they assisted, they participated in the effort. Not barking is fine, it's nice, there will be a reward, but it's not anywhere near the same as the reward for actually putting your shoulder to the work and being involved in the carrying and in the mitzvah of the actual exodus itself. And that's why the donkey is rewarded with a level of kedusha of holiness, because the donkey actually helped with effort, whereas the dog was simply quiet. This is a principle we learn about in Pirkei Avos, a very famous principle, the Fumtsara Agra. According to the amount of effort that you put into something, that's the amount of reward. 
you put in a little bit of effort, you get a little reward. You put in a lot of effort, you'll get a lot of reward. And when it comes to, and the lesson for us is, when it comes to performing mitzvahs, the more effort you put into performing a mitzvah, the more reward you get. You can do it in an easy way. <clears throat> Take the simplest approach, the least intrusive pro- approach, or you can do it maximally. The more effort, the more reward. And when it comes to mitzvahs, the difference in treatment between the donkeys and the dogs should remind us that we should be putting forth effort, not the minimum, but to put forth the entire effort that we have. So I want to show you this <coughs> from a, what maybe you, you may consider a, a very unusual source. And it's a source that relates to football. If you follow football at all, a person that you undoubtedly will know about is John Madden. Now, he passed away about three years ago. But John Madden, for decades, was Mr. Football. First of all, he loved every aspect of the game. He was a player. He was a coach. He was a commentator on TV for many, many years. Many, many people for years and years who watched American football on television probably saw John Madden giving his commentary. And not only that, but in his entire life, he was an ambassador for football. He lived football. He loved it, and he wanted everybody else to love football. He was uh, an exuberant person. When he passed away, there was a tribute to him that was written by Tom Coughlin. Now, Tom Coughlin was a head coach of the New York Giants, as well as some other teams. Two times his team won the Super Bowl. So he was a a very successful football coach. And he wrote a tribute when John Madden passed away. And he talked about how much he loved football, the things that I mentioned, and what he did for the game, how he popularized it, how much people loved him. But he added something very personal. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. In 2007, Coughlin was the head coach of the New York Giants. Now, let me explain just a little bit of football uh, strategy if, you, if you're if not one of those people that follow, follow it, but it's actually kind of relevant right now where we are in this season. So um, in pro football, as you get towards the end of the season and then there are playoffs and then the final two teams go to the Super Bowl, that's the like the World Series of football, the Super Bowl, and then that declares the winner for that year. As you get to the end of the season, <clears throat> coaches always have this dilemma. Should they play their best players or should they put in the second string players? Because if they play their best players, well, they're going to have the best chance to win the game to go on to maybe winning the Super Bowl. But every game that their best players play in they run a risk of getting hurt. Football is, and it's a serious subject for another time, but it's a dangerous game. People get hurt. And so what happens if you're playing your best player and that player gets hurt and then you're in the Super Bowl without your best player? Okay, so that's a a lot of discussion and it's a dilemma, especially as you get towards the end of the season. So here's what happened. In 2007, the New York Giants had already reached the playoffs. So that means that no matter what else happens, they're in. They're in the playoffs. 
but they still had one more regular season game to play. The one, the regular season game left to play was against the New England Patriots. At that time, the New England Patriots were undefeated. Best team in football that year. So there was a lot of discussion about what the Giants should do with this game. Because on the one hand, they didn't really need to win this game. They're already in the playoffs. They might as well put in the second stringers and, and, and uh, uh, protect the best players because they're going to be in the playoffs. They're going to need their best players. So they should put in their second stringers. And even though it means, especially playing against the New England Patriots, that they are probably going to lose, but it won't matter because they're still in the playoffs anyway. And a lot of uh, fans were arguing about this. And Tom Coughlin decided, doesn't matter that we're already in the playoffs. We're putting on our best team, our best players. We're playing to win. It doesn't matter if we already have a spot in the playoffs. We're playing to win. Okay. They play with the best players. They played their hearts out. They played to win. And uh, they lost 38 to 35. It was a close game, but they lost. So Coughlin writes, I will never forget walking into my office at 5 a.m. the next morning. And I saw the light flashing on my phone and I listened to a voicemail message that was waiting for me from John, John Madden. So listen to the voicemail message that John Madden leaves for Tom Coughlin after this difficult loss, but this decision about playing the best players. Here's what Madden said. <clears throat> Just called to congratulate you and your team for a great effort last night. Not good, but great. I think it's one of the best things to happen to the NFL in the last 10 years. And I don't know if they all know it, but they should be very grateful to you and your team for what you did. I believe so firmly in this that there is only one way to play the game. And that's you go out to win the game and I am just so proud of being part of the NFL and what you guys did and the way you did it. You proved that it's a game and there's only one way to play the game and you did it. The NFL needed it. We've gotten so much of, well, we're going to arrest our players. We don't need to win and therefore we don't have to try so hard. Well, that's not sports and that's not competition. I'm a little emotional about this. I'm just so proud. I'm just so proud of what you did. Okay, so that is about football. So depending on what you think about football, that's football. But the message is even more important when it comes to mitzvos. You could try to take the easy way to do the minimum, to slide by, to just barely fulfill your minimal obligation. Or you can give it your best effort. You can make it as beautiful as maximum with all the effort that you bring to it as if everything depends on this mitzvah. And the lesson that we learn from the difference between the donkey and the dog, lefum tsara agra, give it your best effort. Don't hold back. Because the more we put into a mitzvah, the more we get out of it. So please do not take this the wrong way. But in the context of our Torah portion and this particular message, it's good to be like the dog. But it's much better to be like the donkey. My friends, I wish you a good day. And I look forward to seeing you soon in person.